This panel session is on existential threats and risks uh, to humanity and human security. Um, and we're particularly focusing on the role that education can play in terms of enhancing um, solutions, ideally, going forward. Um, so uh, I'll just quickly get, give an overview of what we mean by existential threats before we get into the panel discussion. Um, but essentially, uh, what we're describing as existential threats within the context of this panel um, include uh, threats to human existence and human civilization. Um, and um, they can be clustered uh, around some of the main headings that are often used to describe the sustainable development goals, um, which I've um, framed as planet, people, uh, peace and prosperity. So, um, so for example, uh, under planetary threats to uh, human existence, we can include things like climate change and biodiversity loss, as well as um, things like uh, meteorites um, or uh, mega earthquakes as well. Um, whilst people um, include things like uh, pandemics, uh, whether they're um, from uh, nature or from or synthetically or genetically uh, modified. Um, and then peace is uh, more obvious in terms of it's related to wars, particularly uh, nuclear annihilation. Um, and prosperity, particularly, this includes things like um, the, the threats of uh, artificial intelligence um, and also uh, unsustainable growth um, and widening inequalities. Um, we can frame uh, existential threats in a sort of linear fashion, but more significantly going forward is how they interact and how they interrelate. And these have, in, in that context, they've been described as um, the growing threats within the context of what's called a polycrisis, which no doubt we'll hear a little bit more about from, especially from Mike um, in, in the panel. Um, in essence, they reinforce and uh, exaggerate each other, as as and that makes it especially important when we're thinking about the role of education, um, not looking at it in a linear fashion, but actually how things uh, interact um, within uh, systems and how they reinforce and how we might be able to intervene as part of that solution. In terms of education, just to clarify, the scope of education is not just school education. We're looking at education across the life course um, from early years, primary, secondary, tertiary education, um, including uh, research institutions and lifelong learning. Um, we can also think about education in the context of uh, skills, knowledge, capabilities, um, and what's needed in terms of our future workforce, um, and also in terms of professional development um, more specifically as well. Um, other aspects of education that will be touched upon uh, during the course of the afternoon panel session include the role of innovation and research, um, as well as uh, leadership uh, and how to develop wise leaders going forward. Um, something I think that's kind of, uh, you know, essentially the growing threats from the, from the sort of existential um, risks that we face require a different form of leadership. Um, and uh, we'll hear a bit more from Monif, I hope, uh, towards the end of the panel on that. So um, I don't want to hold us up, so I'm going to start introducing um, the panel, uh, the panelists, if they can take it in turns um, to introduce themselves uh, in terms of their sort of the background experience they have um, and uh, why why they're interested in this agenda, particularly as well. Um, so just a quick round of introductions. 
introductions. Um, myself as chair, just to quickly say, um, I'm, I have a public health background. I've worked in at national and uh, international levels, um, but I also have worked uh, in policy on education, uh, heading education for the Commonwealth. Um, and over the last few years, um, have um, I'm an advisor for a group called the Interaction Council, uh, a group of former heads of government. So um, particularly looking at the threats from um, health risks, but also from uh, climate change and the uh, planetary uh, emergency. Um, and also, before we do introductions, just to say, the panellists uh, are um, in part drawn from a recently established group uh, from the World Academy of Art and Science, a working group that's particularly looking at existential risks and threats to humanity, um, where new information still evolving, um, and we will welcome uh, interest from any other members um, going forward. So I'll put my email in the chat. Uh, do contact me if you're interested in going forward. So uh, let's make a start then. If uh, Mike, do, if you could just give a quick introduction to yourself and we'll just take it in turns. Um, if you can just describe uh, your sort of background experience and interest in a couple of minutes, and then we'll get on to the panel questions. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Okay, basically, I'm a futures bibliographer and critic. And I got into futures bibliography in 1969 when I was working at the Education Policy Research Center at Syracuse. So, I'm, and that's also the uh, focus of my dissertation was an overview of uh, education uh, trends and indicators. So, that, but that was 50 years ago, and I'm revisiting a lot, a lot of that. As far as my interest in uh, existential threats, it's a form of uh, thinking about the future that virtually all futurists I know of aren't thinking about, and I think that it's uh, that that it's very important. Good morning, all. Um, David Harry's Canadian, uh, globally experienced in security, defense, and national development, and professional development in those fields. I'm a committed practitioner of foresight because the things we have to prepare most for are what's coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, Ortwin, uh, could you kindly introduce yourself as well? Sure. My name is Ortwin Wren. I'm from Potsdam in Germany. I uh, used to be the scientific director of a research institute for sustainability. I have been involved specifically in risk research from a social science perspective, and I have been working with the National Risk Governance Council on specific frameworks for dealing with catastrophic risk, systemic risk, and uh, uh, future threats. Uh, thank you very much. And Thomas? Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm Professor Thomas Walter. I'm a research fellow at the University of Melbourne in Australia, but currently based in Germany. I'm an anthropologist, um, work in Asia and uh, especially Indonesia. I've had uh, research on many topics, but in recent years, it's more and more on environment and specifically on food systems, their resilience and the risks that are, uh, we are facing. Uh, when it comes to uh, food security. And uh, I'm also a trustee and executive member of the World Academy. Thank you. And Monif, thank you. I am uh, Monif Zorbi. I'm from Jordan, based in the Middle East. Uh, I'm a trustee of the World Academy of Arts and Science. Uh, founding director of the World Sustainability Forum and science advisor to the Interaction Council of Former Heads of State. My background is in civil and environmental engineering, and then a major shift into science and technology policy for development. Um, my interest in this is uh, essentially stems from trying to knock on the doors of politicians to take note 
of existential threats and try and do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you, everyone. So just to say, um, we have a series of uh, panel questions. I'll read them out as we go in turn. Um, and we have uh, an initial uh, response from each of the panelists. Um, if you could try and keep to between three to five minutes um, in your response, shorter is fine. Um, so that we can allow a bit of time um, for sort of interactive discussion amongst the panelists. And um, if uh, any of the participants have any questions, please do uh, post them on the chat as well. Um, and do raise your hand uh, to interrupt as well if, you, if you've got any questions going forward. Um, we're due to finish it. Uh, um, I think we've got... Ooh about uh, 40 minutes left so we've got we've got sufficient time to kind of go take each question in turn of which we've got about five okay so um mike uh you're the first respondent and the question um to to focus on um in the first instance is how should education change in order to address existential threats a small question for you and uh, i know you've got a very full answer please go ahead uh, okay i i prepared some comments before this uh uh in which i had uh, five headline uh headline comments that uh, first the overlap technology overlap and potential reinforcement between human security and the sdgs and i think that's a no-brainer but a lot needs to be done on that Secondly, I think it is essential, I would argue, that uh, everyone should acknowledge the evidence-based dark side of uh, aspirational comments, uh, such as uh, frequently made uh, like this morning. Uh, and difference between polycrisis, which is in the present, and existential threats, which are either in the immediate future or, or far off. Uh, now, to address the question specifically, how should education change? It should be how should our thinking about education change? We should stop thinking about education as a whole. I mean, I, I listened to the introductory panel and all I hear is education, occasionally with mention of schools or with uh, colleges and universities, but, the, but that's quite separate. And there's uh, five or six million schools in the world of all sorts. Most of them are underfunded and poorly equipped with, uh, with uh, uh, under-trained teachers. And uh, even in the so-called advanced countries, we have a lot of stress in the schools, especially because of the pan pandemic. Uh, in terms of higher education, uh, uh, that's that uh, colleges and universities for undergraduates. That's a separate category. Then the third category you should think about more, uh, more uh, uh, seriously is uh, graduate education, PhD and master's programs, as well as non-credit uh, programs and courses of which there are a lot. And then finally, uh, what I call kind of adult education or civic, civic education. Uh, <clears throat> I, I subscribe to six periodicals to find out what's happening in the world. Uh, New York Times, uh, Bloomberg Business Week, The Week, Time, uh, The Economist, and and uh, the Guardian Weekly. And I seldom, if ever, see sustainability mentioned in any of them, let alone the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, I, th I think that's uh, that's a major problem is to getting more publicity for the for the SDGs and now for existential threats, which make them more important than ever. The second comment I have is that instead of aspiration, uh, confining oneself to well-meaning aspirational comments, which we had in the introduction, uh, to think of the uh, World Academy slogan uh, uh, for leadership and thought that leads to action, and insufficient attention is paid to to the action part, and it's just kind of the assumption that well, whatever we do, this is going to lead to action. Ain't so. 
Okay, what you have to do is, uh, in addition to the aspirational comments of what we ought to have done, you need to have the grubby empirical work of what is being done and where and how you can help it along. And through the security and sustainability guide, we've done some of this on a very limited basis, but it's what I call a foothold or in military terms, you could call it a beachhead. But we have a, a uh, uh, what I call a quick look to education for sustainability in the SDGs, a short guide to advocating organizations. It's on our securesustain.org website and it covers more than 50 organizations and 11 reports for both the lower system of schools and for uh, higher education of organizations that are already promoting sustainability. And that is where you should start in trying to get these organizations and, and, program, and programs to consider both human concern, security as well as existential threats, which make it even more, more imperative. Uh, secondly, we also have a quick look for higher education for sustainability and peace, a quick look, a look at PhD programs, which has uh, 53 programs and 40 institutions. And uh, we just, uh, this is just a small foothold uh, where we just stopped at the PhD programs. There's a lot more master's programs and there's a lot, lot more courses that are available. For example, the SDG Academy, which is part of SDSN, they have 35 online programs, uh, online courses that are free for the taking, but who knows about that? Therefore, what you need is a, a guidebook, the same way you have travel guides everywhere uh, and guides to the flora and fauna uh, everywhere and in great detail, but there's no guide to the uh, programs, the formal programs or the courses that are available to would-be learners of all ages. Okay, third point. Uh, uh, I concluded my prepared comments on saying now is the time to begin thinking about Agenda 2040. That Agenda 2030, the SDG goals, is not going to be met. It may be met in part, but uh, there's uh, obviously two major setbacks from both the pandemic and the and uh, Putin's folly in uh, in Ukraine, which are you know very costly and uh, and disoriented. And we have a poly crisis now, and you can see it in various uh, documents on uh, the SDGs that uh, uh, some of these goals are not going to be met, or there's threat and reversal, and so so forth. I can I can document a, a lot of that. So when 2030 arrives, what are the, what is the UN going to do? There's going to be a new set of goals, and I think it's time to start thinking about it now. The 2040. And that is the opportunity, again, to integrate uh, human security concerns as well as existential, existential threats. Uh, finally, uh, I hope sometime to prepare a draft uh, statement of the, that pulls together, we have a bibliography and we now have a list of, uh, of uh, uh, 24 organizations uh, that are concerned with existential threats that, uh, that will be the uh, for, that will uh, be the background for a draft uh, a report on uh, on the poly crisis, and uh, part of that is going to talk about also the headwinds that are involved and why we have a problem. And the problem is that we live in a world of info glut where you have uh, an awful lot of knowledge, which is just uh, trivial, and also uh, an awful lot of entertainment. Uh, Neil Postman had a book several decades ago, Amusing Ourselves to Death, and boy, it's, 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 uh, it's really so now, where you have um, streaming television, where uh, our local provider offers 80,000 <laughs> Uh, series and programs, uh, and all of this is distraction, as well as organized uh, sports, as well as disinformation, and uh, uh, a substantial part of uh, at least the U.S. Uh, uh, voting public that wants to, uh, quote unquote, make America great again, which is an empty, uh, stupid, um, empty slogan. So uh, then there are other problems also in there, which I will get into. Uh, finally, uh, as a futures bibliographer, I have to have, end with two citations. Uh, first, 
uh, in case you aren't familiar with it, called Knowledge for What, written by the well-known sociologist Robert Lind, published by Princeton in 1939. But it's it's still a, still a classic which ought to be considered. And then for those that are concerned about the curriculum, uh, this is a probably a relatively recent book. This is only only 33 years old, uh, calling Rethinking the Curriculum Toward an Integrated Interdisciplinary College Education. And that's the place to start right there. It has uh, wonderful essays by the late Hazel Henderson, uh, by Robert Costanza, who's a leader in the ecological economics, which uh, SDSN has uh, yet to understand, by Francis Moore Lappe, by Johan Galtung, Visioning a Peaceful World, by Russell Peterson, who asks, why not a separate college of integrated studies? But this is the place to go. Published by Greenwood Press in um, 1990. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Mike. That's really appreciated and a, a useful overview um, on the educational aspects. Um, we're, are there any questions from or any other contributions from other panelists before we move on to um, hear from David? I just want to, and to uh, put your hand up if anything else you want to say. Um, but uh, there's a, a question in the chat from Elif. Um, which is about, uh, is there a commonly agreed list of existential um, risks and threats? Um, and uh, which ones are urgent? Which, um, and uh, how do we prioritise them? Do we include environmental problems? Um, and uh, yeah, uh, many of these questions, I'd say, uh, some of the points that we've been talking about in the existential uh, risks and threats working group um we probably don't have the time to kind of go through this particularly um in this panel discussion because we're focusing particularly on education as a part of the solution um but i think one of the things that mike's been describing is that there's a lot of different organizations but there's no common consensus or agreement about what's meant by existential threats or in terms of definitions or a list of uh, priorities. So it's a very good question and there's no uh, definitive answer to that as yet. Um, but it's something I think that the World Academy of Art and Science could play a role in trying to um, bring together different groups um, and institutions that are working on this um, and advocate for uh, sort of uh, some sort of, I mean, it would never be a consensus, but uh, a, a sort of common positions um, to try and advocate and raise the priority and profile of existential threats. So good question. Um, let's move on now to uh, uh, David, who's answering the question, amongst other things, I dare say, on how can education about threats become an instrument for enhancing human security. So in essence, looking at the links between existential threats and human security, it could be argued that it's uh, existential threats, especially collectively, um, are, are the uh, most significant threat to human security um, and general security overall. David, please take it away. Um, everything I'm going to say is based on three premises. Existential threats are coming, they're in the future. And therefore, if we're going to be prepared, we've got to do foresight, we've got to anticipate. We have to sit down and talk about what the future might contain. That's one. Two, there are four categories of existential threats. There's the ones that we can't do anything about in the first incidence, volcanoes, earthquakes, but, in the second and third and fourth order, we can do things. Some of you have probably seen many, many pictures of the earthquake crisis in Turkey, and you've seen buildings crumble in a cloud of concrete dust. Now, the reason those buildings collapsed so readily, so totally, so completely, so quickly, was because they weren't built properly. And other existential threats, the third and fourth, include the idea that 
we aren't really preparing for what's coming. And finally, for me, uh, because I've been involved in a number of wars, disasters, crises, the most important first responders are the survivors. A survivor who was able to take care of him or herself, regardless of their age, will not need help when the formal first responders arrive. And that is a very valuable resource in times of real peril. And existential threats, of course, lead to a lot of damage, a lot of survivors. Now, the questions that we were all asked, I have very short answers. Uh, how education, number one, how education must change. It's got to stop being, and Michael has said this already, a box, a set, a time constrained linear progression. It's got to be a journey over life, learning for everyone. It's got to start at the youngest ages. And fortunately, uh, in institutions like the World Future Studies Federation, they have a large number of exercises that lead on to my second answer, how education must change. Every set of curricula must include foresight because foresight is what will include, improve, enhance our human security. We'll be more confident that we've done some thinking about what we might face in the future. We will do it together because it will be inclusive throughout. And again, the World Future Studies Federation has a very significant list of foresight courses and programs that everybody can use. Risks, I, risks are what threats are spawned by threats. They must be understood enough. We can't, we can't solve a risk, but we can deal with them. They must be understood enough for us together, inclusively, to prepare to respond to recovery and, if we're lucky, to remediate. Uh, a new discipline, it's not about existential threats. It must be foresight in every curriculum. We must look ahead more than we already are doing. And my final point, because it upset me, being in the military for a long time, uh, often quite famous for its anti-intellectualism, uh, leadership and wisdom must not be institutionalized. They must not be institutionalized. And now, news yesterday, uh, the Guardian books, uh, existential threats, back to the idea of the first category of existential threats, the ones we cannot prevent, we cannot prevent, and they're the ones that we have to think hard about planning and preparing for, because there will be second and third order consequences. And may I finish with a thing I just saw in the news today, Mark Andreessen, an individual who I'm sure uh, you all have heard about, very thoughtful gentleman, very powerful corporate gentleman, uh, just predicted that in a very short order, a university degree will cost a million dollars and a flat screen TV $100. That is a factor we've got to think about in education. Thank you. Um, thank you, David. That, that's a really succinct and helpful summary um, on what we need to do um, in the links with uh, human security. So um, are there any uh, responses from panel members or contributions before we move to Otwin? Um, I, I just also want to highlight uh, Marta's uh, question in the chat, which I think um, may well be taken up uh, later in the panel, possibly by uh, Monif under leadership. Um, it's essentially um, that there are international organisations already dealing with existential uh, risks and catastrophic th uh, threats um, in some shape or form, but what are they missing? Um, and what's our advice to these organisations? Um, my initial response to this is 
the the focus historically has been reactive uh, rather than on prevention and preparedness. Um, but it, it might be something that money um, can also pick up on with regards to leadership and governance. Um, so should we move to uh, uh, Ortwin, um, who's responding to the question about risks? So how will the study of risks be linked to the study of solutions to risks? Um, yeah, and well, Ortwin is a specialist in risks. So I'm yeah. looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would first like to say a little bit about the type of risks that we're dealing with. And when we're talking about threatening risk than polycrisis and risks that lead to polycrisis, we normally think about four different properties that are interlinked. The first property is that these risks generally are transgressional in terms of districts, in terms of institutions, and in terms of geography. Very often they're transboundary. Our second point is that these risks are very often stochastic. We don't know for sure if things are happening, but they can have a very large or not such a large extent, but they have the potential to be life-threatening or even to make a whole system dysfunctional. A third property is that very often these risks have tipping points that for a long period of time, nothing happens. And if the tipping point is reached, then the catastrophe occurs and then it's too late to do anything against it. And the fourth and last point for me on these types of risk is uh, that these risks are very often very controversial in public policy and also in a public discourse uh, because sometimes uh, they're underestimated like climate change, sometimes they're overestimated. And uh, the reason for that is that a lot of symbolic connotations Limitations go along with these risks, and they can have a very strong impact on public opinion and perception. Now, the question is, what does that all mean for education in terms of the four characteristics? The first one is that a disciplinary education doesn't help for dealing with these uh, systemic risks. We need interdisciplinary knowledge and interdisciplinary research because these risks very often are at the interactive stage between nature and society. So they may trigger natural hazards or natural hazards may trigger uh, technological hazards. Uh, they all have an, some influence on behavior. So what we need to know is to get the social scientists and natural scientists and the technological scientists together. Otherwise, we will not be able to master these risks. The second point was the stochastic nature. Again, in education, we have learned that natural science give us determinate answers. Uh, so two and two is four, not five and three. However, in lots of the risk business, we are dealing with triggers that lead to a whole uh, range of true answers in terms of probability estimates. Most people have a very hard time to deal with that. And we have seen in the uh, um, pandemic that uh, uh, if uh, you know you'd enter with vaccination and you say okay three or four people still got it then people say it's worthless however 97 out of 100 it worked and so you know given that people have a hard time to deal with probabilities i think it's very important for education to make probability theory and stochastic reasoning a major element of our education, uh, because we will be more and more confronted with that kind of stochastic uh, responses uh, to specific triggers. The third thing is what I said, tipping points. And that again is a very problematic thing because in learning, we normally learn by trial and error. Also, our uh, economic system is based on trial and error. You go bankrupt and then you can start anew. Now, if there are tipping points, that type of learning is not very good because if you learn by trial and error, you get positive feedback for a long time. You do the same thing all over again. Then you reach the tipping point and then you can't learn anymore because you already run into the catastrophe. So what we have to do in terms of education is to learn how to anticipate potential harm and do um, uh, 
measures before uh, actually uh, the crisis has come. And, and I think that's very important. It's also not easy because uh, it, it costs money, it costs effort. You don't see uh, the results uh, because you're doing it before the tipping point actually reaches. And the last point is this kind of um, um, discourse quality that we have a lot of conflicts, a, a lot of uh, 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 sorry, uh, amplification, attenuation of risk. There it's very important that we educate how to deal with factual and non-factual information. You know, the internet is full, as we all know, of uh, fake news, uh, of wrong um, uh, information, and we need to teach people, and that's not just in schools, they have to do it all the time, uh, how to discern between rubbish and good estimates. And since the world is stochastic, that's not so easy because sometimes we see counter evidence, doesn't mean that the rule is wrong. But I think it's very important to make that distinction because otherwise people run for the wrong thing. And if we face real, you know, um, apocalyptic risks, we cannot afford to go for the wrong information. So in total, I think education is crucial for dealing with all four elements of these kinds of systemic risks and uh, the kind of poly crisis that we're dealing with. And it's a really very important that we keep education as the main force of making people better prepared for disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Otwin. Um, a very succinct and um, precise overview of the sort of risk landscape um, and how we need to think differently and how education needs to um, adjust itself. Um, and I think that that will become increasingly important uh, going forward, especially with uh, artificial intelligence technology affecting the way that we perceive uh, truth and facts and uh, reality um, and risks going forward. Um, so I think this agenda particularly will become a, a much more significant area that uh, we need to touch upon in education. Um, a any other contributions from panelists at all before we move to Thomas? Uh, Mike, please. Yeah, no, I like Dortmund's comments uh, very much, and especially probability is a should be a major element in our education, and we have to learn how to anticipate, and that's another way to uh, describe what David would call foresight. I just want to to uh, add a comment, kind of amusing, but it also opens up something interesting on. Uh, Several weeks ago, I received, uh, where is it? Yeah, I received uh, this mailing from the Cornell Laboratory of, of Ornithology, which as far as I know is a unique institution uh, for birds. And the uh, they want to get uh, uh, some money from us. And they say, birds at the tipping point need your help now. <laughs> And when you read inside, then certain species of birds are endangered, whereas others, I believe, are not. But uh, that's just my just my rough rough guess. But it, uh, I'm just pointing out how this is used at the same time. This is uh, spreading knowledge and also uh, for commercial purposes of trying to get money to su support the ornitho ornithology laboratory. <laughs> yes. No, and Just I've about even, an hour away from where I, I live. I've even heard the um, use of by the um, uh, fossil fuel companies about uh, being under existential threat. So yes, there is an abuse of <laughs> terminology. Um, oh yes. Yes. And anyway, let's move to um, Thomas, who um, I think is going to give us a, a presentation about uh, biodiversity loss, um, particularly in, in uh, the kind of climate uh, crisis, uh, reflecting um, as well a little on existential threats. Um, should they be a new or specialised discipline or incorporated into the study of risks or under different fields of study? Um, of which I think you have a very succinct answer to that question. But we'll actually, yeah, well, right. in a word, both. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I, I think yeah. existential threats should not be a standalone subject. It would be altogether too morbid, especially at primary or secondary level already, that mm -hmm. generation is burdened by a, a great deal of bad news coming their way. And they're, you know, we don't want to 
undermine their optimism any further. In fact, what we need to do is empower them. And I think therefore a better frame would be to have a interdisciplinary subject on sustainability, perhaps under the heading of Anthropocene studies that would empower young people to, 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 to uh, take a, an attitude of responsibility for planet Earth, for, for nature, because in the Anthropocene, its fate is more or less in our hands. So uh, I wanted to talk about biodiversity because it's a, a problem that, or biodiversity loss, uh, or the threat of catastrophic uh, a disruption to the web of life, because it, it's a good example. Now, the problem is uh, very significant. Between 1992 and 2014, uh, the produced capital per, per person has doubled, and the human capital has also increased by, I think, 13%. But the stock of natural capital per person has declined by nearly 40%. So we have this system where um, accumulating producer and human capital at expense of natural capital is, is what we consider to be the hallmark of economic growth and development. That's what it means. So we're, we're literally devouring the natural world that sustains all life. And while human numbers have exploded, especially since World War II, and also our per capita ecological footprint, uh, nearly all other life is dying away. So we are in the midst of one of the most severe and fastest mass extinctions in the history of the planet. For example, the domestic animals now, you know, raised for human consumption already outnumber wild mammals and birds by far. And second, um, what remains of one's majestic forests and other ecosystems, you know, are destroyed to produce arable land and get access to more raw materials. So similarly, our soils are being depleted, the oceans are on the brink of irreversible damage, and most importantly, Climate change now severely pressures nearly all species, both marine and terrestrial, at a time when their survival is already under threat. Plastics and a cocktail of toxic forever chemicals have now permeated the food chain all the way into our very brains. In short, ours is a life-destroying lifestyle. It doesn't even deserve the word lifestyle. So we appear to hate nature and ultimately, ultimately also, I think, the nature in ourselves, the part that is not rational, modern, mechanical, controllable, that sort of messy organic substrate over which our alienated spirit hovers. And this madness cannot continue without today's partial ruin turning into utter disaster to mourn. Now we have institutions, um, like IPBES, for example, the Inter Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity. Uh, and it issues some reports. Um, and indeed, you know, I've, I've been involved with that as a representative of the discipline of anthropology um, in its stakeholder group, and also as a scoping expert for some of those reports. Indeed, IPES also wants to produce scenarios similar to IPCC, but still lags far behind because political tension to the issue of biodiversity loss is still very low. Uh, but the latest report notes that one million species are facing extinction within the next few decades. So, you know, all of that has vast consequences for the SDG. Um, it will undermine an estimated 80% of the SDG targets, uh, and especially the, you know, the one on, uh, notably the one on eliminating hunger. Indeed, hunger and destitution, destitution are on the rise again and starting to push many uh, vulnerable groups within the human spaces to the brink of extinction also, and threatening social peace and stability. So what can be done? The report that I just mentioned, and I uh, say as I quote, through transformative change, nature can still be conserved and restored. By transformative change, we mean a fundamental system-wide reorganization across 
techno technological, economic, and social factors, including paradigms, goals, and values. It goes back to what often said earlier about systemic uh, transformation. That's what we need to turn this around. But how does one change values and, and goals and attitudes if not through education? Now, taking biodiversity loss as an example, very little attention has been paid to this when it comes to education. How do you educate for that? For example, recently the uh, das 2021 Das Gupta report in, on the economics of biodiversity, uh, which is very good in general, it has only a very tiny section at the end uh, with some uh, uh, notes on, on education, how important it is and all that, but it's just full of platitudes and there's no usable suggestions. And yet, as we heard, it best itself says that the key issue in nature protection is changing human attitudes, values, and behaviors. So I have some suggestions to conclude uh, uh, how we can turn around this destructive trend through education. First, we need to critique Kahn believes that our deliverance will take the form of a technotopia which is the belief that is preached by the dominant modernist religion of today, uh, which sort of has it that all problems have technical solutions, when in fact it's technology that has caused many of the problems we now face for our abuse of technology. Second, we need to create a vision of a new culture, one that is socially and ecologically sustainable. And we don't have that. We have to envisage it. Um, and for that, we need to encourage young people to use their imagination, to have the, the ability to imagine something that does not exist. Okay, this is contrary to the whole sci scientist sort of attitude that all that matters is things, is facts, the real, the concrete, what you can measure, observe. No, this is about what you can create, what we can create. And if we don't do that consciously, we'll, we will continue unconsciously to create this destruction, a uh, future that is full of destruction. And that third uh, suggestion is education in nature. That means involving children in the active care of nature, because I think this will help young genera generations not just to understand, but to actually love nature. And that's where motivations, goals come from. It's feelings. It's not uh, just understanding, you know, rational understanding. Fourth, it's about localizing conservation. Uh, a, a large survey was recently conducted on the impact of environmental education by Ardo and Bowers and Gaylard in 2020. And they discovered that engaging with local issues or locally relevant dimensions of broader global issues is the best pathway for education. The solution is for students to collaborate with engaged scientists, local resource, ma resource managers, and community organizations. And my final suggestion, um, I think um, a new approach in education would entail leveraging the fact that schools are today's major community hubs. It's how people get to know each other through their children, uh, through the school community. Therefore, schools have influence that reaches far beyond the education of children, and they should use this influence to lead local sustainability action. It is act action that children imitate, not talk. And if young people take action themselves, they themselves will be examples and will take whole communities with them, I, I suggest. And there's some very good examples of how that can work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, yeah, some very profound comments there for us all to digest as well. Um, and I think some good pointers for Monif. Um, we've, uh, we're already at time, so I'm hoping we're OK to have five minutes as long as we're closed before the next panel session um, goes live. Uh, Monif, in, in a few minutes, can you... Um, give some high level reflections on the implications for leadership, especially wise leadership. Um, you might want to touch upon the importance of values as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, here it is my 
policy flavored intervention, uh, I very quickly say that over the last 100 years, we've had four world wars. There was the First World War, the Second World War, the Cold War, and then the global war on COVID-19. Now, the last of these wars, uh, uh, according to James Lawson, who is a senior fellow at the Adam Smith Institute and the author of their recent paper, Life Without COVID, whereby he says, COVID is no longer a novel virus and we enjoy substantial defenses. Now we need the courage to forge a path back to normality. We have won the war, let's win the peace. Now, this is my the security element of my two-pronged proposal. The second element mentioned already by the previous speakers, we have addressed the MDGs 20 years ago, and we've addressed, we are addressing the SDGs, and we're thinking of the world post the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. Now, this is the development uh, uh, element. Now, uh, going back to the global helicopter view, uh, when the world was standing up to the COVID-19 pandemic, the UN Secretary General advocated that the world must turn to science and solidarity, not least to combat the spreading of the global misinfodemic. At the mm -hmm. same time, we've witnessed how political leaders only paid lip service to science-based advice and pushed their countries to the brink of catastrophe. Thus, here again, educating the leaders would have helped particularly on issues uh, such as the pandemic and uh, uh, the broader issue of climate change. Now, to manage the socio-economic and socio-political fallout in our post-COVID-19 world, polity, our governance mechanisms, need to be educated and informed. It also should focus, that is our approach, on empowerment through education as a foundation of national and international security. We will still witness extraordinary events with polities struggling to maintain social order, upholding security while generally adopting good governance practices. Realizing long-term soft security in most countries can only be achieved by assuring sustainable and equitable socioeconomic development and the promotion of dialogue. Dialogue at the regional level has to gain has to again become the norm in the face of existential threats regionally and globally. A few weeks ago, China officially launched its global security initiative concept paper. The concept paper expounds the core ideas and principles of the GSI, identifies the priorities, platforms, and mechanisms of cooperation, and demonstrates China's sense of responsibility for safeguarding world peace and firm resolve to defend global security. I think such an, such an initiative must be looked at carefully and possibly developed further with the help of international stakeholders. The spirit of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development has to prevail again. We're halfway through, we're not doing well in terms of achieving the 17 goals and 169 targets within the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So we have to revisit the agenda to factor in new health and globalization parameters, as well as elements that have come to undermine the foundations of contemporary society with its rampant inequality and rising injustice, and which threatens the very survival of our species. Let me conclude by quickly referring to the Universal Declaration of Human Responsibilities of the Present Generations Towards Future Generations, currently being launched by the World Sustainability Forum, which says, as humankind enters an era of planetary consciousness, recognizing its common fate and common responsibility, 
implies that we the peoples shall have both the right and responsibility to shape a future for all that is free from want, free from fear, and free from indignity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monif. Um, some profound insights, and I think uh, it would take another um, panel discussion, I think, to explore uh, the international governance and how we might be able to influence that um, going forward. But uh, just to close the session, just to say a big thank you uh, to the panellists as well as the um, participants. Do email any uh, further discussion or, or queries and do get in touch as well if you're interested in um, contributing or joining us as part of the working group um, on existential threats as well. And really, is it um, going forward, we'd like to uh, generate more discussion and advocacy as well so that we can share with a wider group. So look out for um, uh, further ways of interacting um, through the World Academy of Art and Science. Uh, and a big thank you for now. I'm aware we're two minutes to time, so we'd, be we'd better close. Um, but thank you, everyone, and do be in touch. <laughs>